All right. Uh, yeah, thanks everyone for joining us. This is our third week going over Bible basics. And tonight, the uh, topic is going to be why Paul is so important. That's going to be tonight's topic. Um, those of us who rightly divide the word of truth, we understand that we need to understand Paul's doctrine first before we can understand the rest of the scriptures. And Paul wrote uh, the books of Romans through Philemon. And so those are the books of the Bible that are written to us, and therefore our learning first, and then when we understand that, then we can understand the rest of Scripture. But the primary emphasis that we should have is in studying Paul's epistles. Uh, if you look over in 2 Timothy 2.7, Second Timothy two seven. In Second Timothy two seven, Paul says, "Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things." Now Paul gets a lot of criticism. He's called a male chauvinist. He's called you know putting himself above Christ. And we'll get later on before we close tonight, we'll go over why that is. But what we need to understand is that you can look in chapter 3 there, next chapter over, it's 2 Timothy 3, verse 16. It says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. So all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Um, Hold your place there and look at Second Peter chapter one. Second Peter one and verse twenty one. And then after that we'll after reading that verse, then we'll put these first three verses together and to so you can see the point that I'm wanting to make here. Second uh, Peter one Verse 21 says, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So, when you have verses, if you go back to 2 Timothy 2 now, and verse 7, you have that verse where Paul says, Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. To a natural man, you know, if I wrote that down, if I said, consider what Eric says, and the Lord give the understanding of all things, that'd be very egotistical of me to say that. You know, like, I'm the authority, then I know better than everybody else. And Paul is accused of that. You know, how dare Paul elevate himself, saying, you got to consider what I say. But remember the two scriptures we read after that. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And 2 Peter 1.21 says that the Bible is written by holy men of God speaking as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So, if Paul, my point is, if Paul just writes down a letter and it's his own thoughts and he says, Consider what I say and the Lord give the understanding in all things. That's a very egotistical thing to say. But what we need to understand, since all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and all the Scripture that was written down is holy men of God speaking as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, what that means is when Paul wrote down 2 Timothy 2.7, Consider what I say, and the Lord give the understanding in all things, that was not his thought. He wrote it down as the Holy Ghost told him to write it down. He was inspired by God to write it down. Because this epistle, 2 Timothy, is included in your Bible. You know, like, like I say, if Paul wrote... Now, if Paul wrote a, a letter and it wasn't in your Bible and he said that, well, then we would know it wasn't inspired by God it wasn't the Holy Ghost speaking it. So then you could say it's egotistical. Just like if I said, consider what Eric says, 
and the Lord give the understanding in all things. That, that would be a very prideful thing for me to say. But when you understand that Paul wrote that verse down because the Holy Ghost gave him the words to say, he was inspired by God to write that down. Basically, all, did, all Paul did was just hold the pen and write down what God told him to write down. So it's not egotistical at all. It's God telling us, is my point. God is telling us that we need to consider what Paul says for the Lord to give us understanding in all things. It's sort of like if you go over to Numbers chapter 12 to give you another example. Moses was the one who wrote down um, the words for the first five books of your Bible, Genesis through Deuteronomy. And a lot of the narrative that is in Exodus through Deuteronomy has Moses in it. In Numbers 12, verse 3, Numbers chapter 12, verse 3, there is this little parenthetical phrase, and it says, Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. Now, see, if I wrote down, I said, Eric is the most meek person on the world. Well, by me saying that, I'm not meek anymore. I've elevated myself up. Well, Moses wrote this down. But the thing is, it's a true statement because God's word is true. If Moses wrote that down about himself, then he is not meek. But because God had him write that down, Moses just held the pen. That's all he did. And God inspired him and by the Holy Ghost had him write down those words. So that's not Moses' opinion that he is meek. This is God stating the fact that Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. Moses isn't elevating himself. God is just stating the fact of what's going on there. And so that's what we need to keep in mind when we read Paul's epistles. So all the criticism that Paul gets, if, like I say, if it was his words, sure. You know, he's egotistical. But because God is the one who had him write these down, God's word is truth. It's God's word given to us through the pen of Moses. Then it's not egotistical. It's God stating the truth to us. And God tells us in 2 Timothy 2.7, Consider what I say, or what Paul says, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Why is Paul so important? The answer, and what we're going to find out tonight, the answer, the reason Paul is so important is because of the cross of Christ. When you look at Scripture, well, let, let's start with, let's start with uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Usually when we think of the cross of Christ, people automatically think of the crucifixion. They'll think of the account of Jesus' crucifixion at the end of Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. And, I mean, that does give you the historical event of what happened with the cross. But the understanding of what the cross did for us, spiritually speaking, what the cross does, the salvation that is in the cross of Christ, you will only find that in Paul's epistles. You will not find that in your Old Testament or in the New Testament anywhere, even after, even in Hebrews through Revelation, you will not find the importance of the cross of Christ like you do in Paul's epistles. We'll see that in a moment. The reason for that is 1 Corinthians 2, verse 7 and 8. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 7, Paul says, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory. God had in mind the cross of Christ before He even created the world. But... He kept it a secret. It was a mystery. It was hidden wisdom. God ordained it before the world unto our glory, but He did not proclaim it unto the world until 
the Apostle Paul. Verse 8 tells you why. It says, Which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. The princes of this world is a reference to Satan and the devils under him. Because you go over the next, over in chapter, um, well, in 2 Corinthians 4, 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4, Satan is called the God of this world. And he has blinded the minds of them which believe not. He doesn't want people to understand the gospel. So if Satan is the God of this world, then the princes of this world would be Satan and his forces. Basically, God, when he made the heaven and earth, before he made heaven and earth, he had foreknowledge that we would sin, we would fall short of the glory of God, that we would need a redeemer to redeem us. And God came out with the wisdom plan that the way to redeem us, to save us from our sins, to give us eternal life in God's kingdom, would be through the cross of Christ. But if he told Satan and his forces that, then as 1 Corinthians 2.8 says, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. It's just like if you if you're, you got a college football game going on. The coach of one team doesn't go and tell the other team what his plan is. Because if he reveals that, then the other coach can say, Oh, well, I know what to do to stop my that of the team we're playing against from winning. I will make my strategy revolve around what I know about my opponent's strategy. So it's the same thing with God. God comes up with the plan of the cross to save men. If Satan and his forces knew that was God's plan, it says right there, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. If God told Satan, I, man's going to sin, but I'm going to save man by sending my son to die on a cross for their sins. And Satan would say, well, I'm going to make sure that that doesn't happen. So what God does is, he has the plan all along to crucify Jesus as atonement for our sins, but he doesn't tell anybody. He keeps it a secret. When you read the Old Testament, you will not find the cross. If you look up in a concordance, the word cross does not appear in your Bible until Matthew chapter 10. Jesus does not mention to his disciples the, that he is going, that he will die on a cross until Matthew 20. Let me look it up for you. I didn't write them down. Let me look them up for you just so you have those references. Uh, the word cross first time appears in your Bible, Matthew 10 verse 38. And then... Uh, and then it's in Matthew, let's see, Matthew 20, verse 19. Matthew 20, verse 19 is where Jesus, for the first time, tells his disciples that he will be crucified. So that's the first time in your Bible that it is ever revealed that, that Jesus would die on a cross. But it is not revealed that it, is God's, it was God's plan until you get to the Apostle Paul. The reason, so the reason Paul is so important is because the cross is central to his message and you do not find that anywhere else in Scripture. And the reason the cross is so important, look over in Galatians chapter 6. In Galatians chapter 6, Verse 12, Galatians 6, verse 12. Paul says, As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. So that verse there tells you that if you are trusting in the cross of Christ and you're glorying in that, then the result is you're going to suffer persecution. Satan is the God of this world. He thought he was winning the victory over God by having Jesus crucified. But actually, he played right into God's hands. 
And so he lost the victory through the cross of Christ. And so now Satan hate, absolutely hates the cross of Christ because the power, Jesus Christ gets the power of death and hell away from Satan through his death on the cross. And so when we trust in the cross, the cross is really what defines the difference between God's realm and Satan's realm. The cross gets the victory for God or for us, Jesus Christ gets the victory for us over our sin through Jesus' death on a cross. And it is the way that God is able to give all believers eternal life through the cross of Christ. And so, those who trust in the cross, even after you're saved, sound doctrine is, needs to be based on the cross of Christ. Satan will persecute you for that. So that's why he says they suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. Now you drop down to verse 14, Galatians 6, verse 14. It says, But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are not to boast in ourselves. You see, Paul, when he says, Consider what I say, and the Lord give the understanding in all things, he wasn't boasting. That wasn't his words. That was God having them write those down. As Paul says, God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. If I glorify in anything else, then the result is I'm going to be prideful, sinful. What I need to glory is in the thing that caused death to my flesh, spiritually speaking, and brought my spirit alive in Christ. And that is the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. The verse continues and says, By whom? By that cross of Christ. The world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Go back to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. That explains what he just said about he is the, uh, by Christ, the world is crucified unto him. He says in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So the cross is what gives you salvation, eternal life in God. Without the cross of Christ, you are dead in your trespasses and sins. You will burn forever in a lake of fire. The power to deliver you from that lake of fire is the cross of Christ. And He doesn't just deliver you from that and give you a life in heaven, but He gives you abundant life. Jesus said in John 10.10, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. You don't just have a life where you just ha are happy. You have a life where God's love comes through you in heavenly places for all eternity. You can experience that life right now because we already have the atonement. We already have the Holy Ghost given unto us. We already have God's completed word. We can read and believe God's word and live, as this verse says, by the faith of the Son of God. And the only way you live by the faith of the Son of God is if you are crucified with Christ. If you have this attitude, as Galatians 6.14 says, By whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. So the cross of Christ doesn't just save you. The cross of Christ is what sanctifies you. If you glory in the cross of Christ, then you are wanting to read and believe God's word and allow Christ's life to live in you, and you will live not by your flesh, but by the faith of the Son of God, because the faith of the Son of God was perfectly demonstrated on the cross. Jesus Christ, before He went to the cross, sweat as it were great drops of blood when He yielded to the Father completely and said, Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. The cross of Christ is the complete faith of, of Christ in the Father's plan, because Christ completely abandoned any 
fleshly will or any self-will that he would have. Now, he never went by his self-will. I'm not saying that, but, but he completely abandoned any notion he had of how he could please God. And he says, I am completely yielded over to the Father, even given my very life. And I'm trusting in my Father, God the Father. When you believe God's Word and get that sound doctrine in the inner man and allow Christ to live in you, that's what you're doing. You are crucified to the world because you are crucified with Christ. And you are living by the faith that Christ had when He was on that cross. So the cross doesn't just save you. It sanctifies you. Abundant eternal life is in the cross of Christ. And you can experience that abundant eternal life right now. And only Paul tells you that. You may say, well, wait a minute. The cross is mentioned before. And I, you know, I gave you those first couple of verses. The word cross is there. But what the cross accomplishes is only seen in Paul's epistles. Look over in Acts chapter 2. Most people, most of Christianity will tell you they believe that the church that we're in today started in Acts chapter 2. We teach that the dispensation of grace that we are currently in started in Acts chapter 9 with Paul. And you may say, well, what's the big deal? It's only seven chapters. The big deal is, as I just mentioned, the reason Paul is so important is the salvation and sanctification found in the cross work of Christ is only found in Paul's epistles. In Acts chapter 2, Peter preaches to these devout Jews that were dwelling in Jerusalem. And he preaches the cross, but he does not preach it as salvation. He does not say, trust in the cross to have eternal life, or Jesus died on a cross for your sins. He does not say that. He preaches the cross as bad news, not as good news. In Acts 2, verse 22, Acts 2, verse 22, he says, Ye men of Israel, okay, he's not talking to us today, where we are today, he's talking to Israel. He says, Hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. And then you go down to verse 36. He says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. What that tells you, you, go back up to verse 34. In verse 32, it says, This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Basically what Paul tells you, I'm sorry, Peter, what Peter tells you in Acts 2.22 is here's Jesus of Nazareth, verse 23, ye have taken him, by wicked hands you have crucified and slain him. Verse 32 says God raised Jesus from the dead. Verse 33 says he's at the right hand of God. And he has received rewards for he's been exalted to the right hand of God. And then it says he is going to sit at his right hand. Verse 35 says, until I make thy foes thy footstool. And verse 36 says that God has made him both Lord and Christ and you crucified him. So if you by wicked hands crucified and slain Jesus Christ and God made him Lord and Christ, he's Lord over all, and God says, sit down until I make thy foes thy footstool, 
What that means for Israel here is the cross is very bad news because they just crucified the Lord who is now going to judge them. They are now his enemies, his enemy, because they, with wicked hands, crucified and slain him. They are in a lot of trouble here. If this was good news, then verse 37 would say, and they trusted in Jesus' crucifixion and were received eternal life. But it says, verse 37, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? In other words, you just we now realize that verse 23, We by wicked hands have crucified and slain Jesus. God has made him both Lord and Christ. He is exalted. He's sitting in heavenly places. And he's waiting for his enemies to be destroyed. And we are his enemies. So what are we going to do? Cl clearly it's bad news. And then verse 38, Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So the cross is preached as bad news. The gospel or good news given unto them is to repent and be baptized. There is no, um, there is no preaching of the cross for salvation there. So it is bad news at the time. Go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 is the first time in your Bible that the cross of Christ is preached as good news. Now, I mean, you can understand that from Romans, but in terms of if you're looking for a clear, what I'm talking about is finding one verse that clearly tells you that the cross is what saves you. It's the good news. The first time in your Bible, it's not Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, it's not in your Old Testament, it's not even in the book of Acts. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. You are told directly in that verse that the cross saves you by the power of God. First time in your Bible that the cross is good news. And there are only two other times that it is good news again. Again, I'm saying, you know, you could figure it out in Romans because Paul was preaching the mystery. But in terms of finding a verse that says, the cross gives you eternal life. You know, Romans 1.16 says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. But it doesn't mention the cross in that verse. This verse, verse 18, says, the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. So, the gospel of Christ includes the cross, Romans 1.16, but you're not directly told that the cross is the power of God to save you until you get to 1 Corinthians 1.18. And the other two times in your Bible where the cross is mentioned as the power of God to save you is Ephesians 2.16. Go over to Ephesians 2.16. Ephesians 2.16. 16, it says that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. So that tells you, in this, that when it says both, it's talking about both Jew and Gentile in its context. But it's saying that you are reconciled unto God by the cross. So the cross we saw in 1 Corinthians 1, 18 is the power of God to save you. Here it tells you that the cross reconciles you to God. And then the third passage is Colossians chapter 1, verse 20. 
Colossians chapter 1, verse 20. Start in verse 19, Colossians 1, 19. For it pleased the Father that in Him, that is in Christ, should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of His cross, by Him to reconcile all things unto Himself, by Him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. So that verse tells you that Jesus made peace through the blood of His cross. And he also, re and that was part of him reconciling all things unto himself. So 1 Corinthians 1.18 tells you the cross is the power of God to save you. Ephesians 2.16 tells you you're reconciled to God by the cross. And Colossians 1.20 tells you that Jesus made peace between you and God through the blood of his cross. Remember, the cross is the power of God into salvation. It is it, by the cross, I am crucified unto the world and the world unto me. By being crucified with Christ, I live by the faith of the Son of God. The cross is the power of God. And only Paul has that information for us. As we saw before in 1 Corinthians 2.8. God all along planned to reconcile us to Himself through the cross of Christ. But it was a secret, a mystery, hidden until revealed to the Apostle Paul. That's why Paul says in 2 Timothy 2.7, Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. If you took Paul's epistles out of your Bible, Romans through Philemon, you would not know that the cross, you would not have a verse that tells you the cross is the way that God would save you. Only Paul tells you that. And you understand, and then the, the mystery doctrine, when he said in 1 Corinthians 2 8, when he says there in verse 7, we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So, the cross really is what starts your understanding of the mystery. There's all kinds of, there's a lot of other doctrine in Paul's epistles between Romans and Philemon, but it's all based upon the foundation of the cross. You go to chapter 3 there in 1 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul talks about you know, the, the mystery the, that was committed directly to Paul by Jesus Christ. And we're going to go over that in a minute. Um, and the doctrine associated with it. You see here in 1 Corinthians 3 verse 9, he says, For we are laborers together with God, ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder. He is, Paul, by God, the Holy Ghost, is telling us through the pen of the Apostle Paul that Paul is a wise master builder. And the reason is because he has laid the foundation of the cross work of Christ. Because God, or Jesus Christ specifically committed the message of the mystery, the cross and all associated doctrine, specifically to Paul to give to us. And you notice he says there, so he says in verse 10, according to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. And verse 11 tells you what the foundation is. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. The foundation throughout Scripture, he is called the chief cornerstone of God's building. He is called the stumbling stone uh, over which Israel fell. He is the, the cornerstone which the builders rejected. He is the cornerstone, the foundation of God's spiritual building, that house 
that God is building using us in Christ. And it's all based upon that foundation of the cross work of Christ. He says, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. That's why Paul is so important. The only way you're going to grow spiritually is if you understand the cross work of Christ and glory only in the cross. And the reason then that Paul gets so much criticism by churchianity and the reason that all these denominations try to put Paul down and look to other people is because then they can get away from the foundation. The cross is mentioned in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and Acts, but it's only seen as good news in Paul's epistles. So if Satan can get you away from Paul's epistles and get you to read other books of the Bible, he can trick you into thinking the power isn't in the cross. He can, think, he can make you think that it's me, that I trusted in Jesus, and so now I can go out and serve God and do all these good works for God. That's the primary message that the church today, the denominations teach you. If, if they mention the cross of Christ... It's just that first step, and once I recognize that, then it's all about me. It's about Christ died for me, now I will live for him. Christ saved me, now I am going to join the church. I'm going to pay tithes. I'm going to do works. I'm going to do all these things for God. And they can get that message across, and it sounds okay, biblically speaking, when they ignore Paul. But when you consider what Paul says, then the Lord will give you understanding that the foundation of God's building is the cross of Christ. And you trust in that, and now any foundation, anything you build upon it, you have to glory in the cross. So then that way, it's not about me. It's all about living by the faith of the Son of God. So, responding to the criticisms that people give regarding Paul, you know, oh, you're elevating Paul, you're talking too much about Paul. Let's go over to 1 Corinthians 14. And this goes along with the point we made when we first started tonight. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 37 says, 1 Corinthians 14, 37, If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Paul just held the pen. That's all he did. He's not boasting in himself. God told him what to write down. Now, if he wrote things other than this. He wrote at least three letters to the Corinthians, probably four, maybe more. We've only got two in Scripture. If you had one of those other epistles that he wrote to the Corinthians, and he said something like, Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things, or I am a wise master builder then you might say, oh, Paul's egotistical because he used his words. But when we know all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and that Paul spake as he was moved by the Holy Ghost, and he says here, what he writes unto you are the commandments of the Lord, then we know it's not Paul being egotistical. It's just Paul simply being the messenger, relaying the information that Jesus Christ gave him. And you can see that if you go over to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. In Galatians chapter 1, verse 11, Paul says here, But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. That tells you the gospel that Paul preached was different from what the apostles preached. In Acts chapter 9, God sent Ananias to Paul for him to receive his sight. Ananias did not preach the gospel of trusting in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sins. Ananias did not tell Paul that because Paul says here, he did not receive it of man, neither was he taught it but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Ananias did not know 
to trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for sins. He knew the information of Acts 2 that Israel was in a heap of trouble because they by wicked hands crucified and slain the Lord Jesus Christ, who is now sitting at the right hand of the Father. The information that Ananias had or any of those early apostles before the mystery was given to Jesus Christ was the cross was something that got Israel into a whole lot of trouble. God had sent his, had sent his son, the Messiah, to save Israel, and they by wicked hands crucified him. They got into worse. They were already sinners and were unbelievers. Now they're in even more trouble for crucifying their own Messiah. That was the information that all those early apostles had. It wasn't until Jesus Christ gave the revelation to Paul that the gospel, the good news for today, is trusting in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for sins. There is a transition then. Peter preaches the cross as bad news. Paul now preaches it as good news because Jesus Christ now revealed that to him. Look over in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 17. 1 Corinthians 9 verse 17. Paul says for, or you go back to verse 16, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me, yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. The reason Paul is so important is he is given the mystery, new information, and Jesus Christ says, by revelation to Jesus Christ, he says, I've got some good news that I want you to preach, Paul. And that good news is to trust in my death, burial, and resurrection. And they'll have eternal life as a result of that. I want you to dispense that gospel for me. And that is going to be the foundation of God's building. And then upon that foundation, we'll build all the other doctrines. The Holy Ghost teaching you the things of God found in Paul's epistles. The love of God coming through you. Uh, suffering in order to build up patience and experience and hope, as Romans 5, 3 through 5 talks about. The cross is the foundation. I'm saved by that. I am sanctified by that. I am only to glory in the cross. Paul's focus is the cross as good news upon which God is building his building, the chief cornerstone. Again, the chief cornerstone is seen prophetically in Isaiah. It's seen over in uh, 1 Peter chapter 2. There are other references outside of Paul that talks about Jesus as the cornerstone. But only Paul preaches the cross as good news. And when you get outside of Paul's epistles then, remember what we read before in Galatians, I think it's Galatians 5 if we were over there. And we were in Galatians 6. Galatians 6 and verse 12 as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. Go back to chapter 5, verse 11. Galatians 5, 11. And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. The offense of the cross. The cross offends your flesh. The cross says, I am no good. I have no righteousness in myself. I am such a wicked person that God had to send His only begotten Son and He had to make the... He had to die on a cross for my sins. That's how bad my sin is. It... I am The cross offends my flesh. It confronts how bad it... See, I, my flesh wants to look good. It says, well, you know, I'm a pretty good person. You know, I, I take care of my family. I work a job. You know, I'm nice to people. When someone rubs me the wrong way, I, I brush it off. So I'm a fairly good person. That's what the flesh says. The cross of Christ says, there is none good, no, not one. 
There is none righteous, no, not one. You are such a wicked and vile person in your flesh that God had to send His Son and He had to die on a cross. It wasn't just, oh, slap His wrist, you know, uh, put Him in jail for three, for, you know, for a day or two, um, you know, have Him go around and c confess your sins to a priest, as the Catholics say. No, it caused death. My sin caused the Messiah to die. He had to go to a cross and suffer cruel torture. Worst suffering you could ever have. All because I have sinned. That offends my flesh. And so Satan will do everything he can to get you out of Paul's epistles so that you will not focus on the cross as good news. We'll still mention the cross so that it deceives your flesh, or deceives your spirit, your soul, deceives your soul into thinking that you are still following God and His Word because we mentioned the cross of Christ. But the power of the cross, where I glory in the cross, where I'm crucified with Christ, when I live by the faith of the Son of God, that power is completely done away in a church system that glorifies my works after the cross. And so that's why Paul suffers such a, a great attack. Look over in Ephesians chapter 3. This is why Paul, people come up with all kinds of excuses not to believe Paul. They'll say, oh, he was a male chauvinist. He was uh, full of himself. He had all this pride. They do everything they can to say, you're elevating Paul. You need to stop doing that. You need to elevate Jesus. Let's read the red letters of Jesus. Well, Galatians 1 says... Paul got his gospel by revelation of Jesus Christ, then I am elevating Jesus when I follow Paul. If I don't follow Paul, if I don't follow this mystery doctrine in Romans through Philemon, then what I'm doing is I am degrading Jesus. Jesus Christ gave a revelation to Paul and says, Paul, I want you to dispense this good news, this gospel to the world. And churchianity comes along and says, we don't want your good news because it offends us. The cross of Christ offends our flesh. So we are going to deceive people into thinking they're following God by getting rid of Paul and following the red letters of Matthew through John, when really the way you follow Jesus Christ is by following Paul, because Jesus Christ gave the revelation to Paul that he has here. Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 2. He says, If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto the, me the mystery, as I wrote a four and few words. So there you have God, by revelation, made known unto him the mystery. This isn't Paul as a male chauvinist or Paul as an egotistical person. This is God by revelation, making known unto him the mystery, verse 4, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Christ is the one who gave him that doctrine. Verse 5, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body, and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. When you discount Paul and you try to follow the red letters of Matthew through John, what you are saying is, I despise the gift of the grace of God and the effectual working of the power of Christ in my life. And instead, I want to follow, I want to take a God's Word, Matthew through John, it's still God's Word, but I want to take that and I want to manipulate that around to make me look good in the flesh. Essentially, that's what you're doing when you do that. Look over at Colossians chapter 2, because Ephesians 3, 4 mention his knowledge in the mystery of Christ. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 2, Colossians 2, 2, 
It says that their hearts might be comforted being knit together in love and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God, there's that mystery again, and of the Father and of Christ in whom, in Christ, are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. When you put Paul down and you go back to the red letters, you don't have the mystery because it wasn't, it wasn't given to man until given to Paul. In that mystery is hit all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. They're treasures, spiritually speaking. Physically speaking, treasures is gold, silver, money, a house, fancy car. But when I die, any treasures of this world I have, they fade with me. I can't take a house, gold, money. I can't take any of that with me. But spiritually speaking, the treasures are wisdom and knowledge. And those I take with me because they're stored up in my inner man. And my inner man goes into heaven. And then those treasures are used for all eternity. And those treasures, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, today are found in the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. And that mystery is found in Paul's epistles. That's why Paul is so important. And so, in summary, because we're out of time, in summary, it's not that we are elevating Paul, but when we recognize that God gave special information to Paul that was not revealed beforehand, what we are doing, rather than elevating Paul, we are elevating the cross work of Christ, and when we do that, we are glorying in God the Father's plan to share His love throughout all eternity, to all those who would believe him. And when we discount Paul, we're not elevating Christ, but rather we are trying to put down the cross work of Christ. And we are trying to elevate our flesh. And using a form of godliness, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, to say that we are following God when we are really rejecting the power of the cross. The power of the cross was revealed to Paul. Salvation and sanctification found no other place in Scripture regarding the cross of Christ. That's why Paul is so important. Uh, dear Lord, we thank you for being long-suffering toward us and being willing to spend thousands of years with unbelieving man and then finally sharing your treasures of wisdom and knowledge with believers here in the dispensation of grace. What a privilege we have to live in such a time. Help us not to take it for granted, but to glory in the treasures of wisdom and knowledge found only in the mystery and the cross of Christ. To make the cross of Christ our aim by which we are crucified to the world and the world unto us, so that Christ lives in us. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.